Brothers and sisters, hear the words from the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy, chapter 6. But you, man of God, avoid all this. Instead, pursue righteousness, devotion, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Compete well for the faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made the noble confession in the presence of many witnesses. Compete well for the faith. This is taken from today's reading. The church gives us the first reading. The second part of that, 1 Timothy 6, 12. You know, we're hopefully still receiving so many graces from the year of mercy that came to us. And you might remember that, I think it's our Lord who says to St. Faustina that, uh, the mercy is given, especially for the times uh, before uh, his judgment will come. And that great graces that were given in that year of mercy. And maybe you remember Pope Francis's letter to us at the start of Lent this past year. It's a beautiful letter. You can imagine that having called and completed the year of mercy, what was it that Pope Francis asked you and me uh, to prepare ourselves for? He said to us uh, about six months ago, he said, this season urgently calls us to conversion. You and I are asked to return to God with all our hearts, to refuse to settle for mediocrity and to grow in friendship with the Lord. Jesus is the faithful friend who never abandons us even when we sin. He patiently awaits our return. By that patient expectation, he shows us his readiness to forgive. That was the beginning of his letter to us. Refuse to settle for mediocrity. Compete well. Those are the two Sides I like us to think about as we think about trust, refusing to settle for mediocrity, resist mediocrity. You might, uh, maybe you were here last month uh, and heard sisters talk, the wound we are born with, you can watch it on YouTube, it's very deep and penetrating. And in that, she spoke about truth but also untruth. Remember she spoke about that woundedness that we receive, we call it original sin or concupiscence, from our first parents and it occurred in a garden and it was an untruth, it was lies. And sister reminded us never to enter into a dialogue with the tempter because he's lying to you, no matter what he's saying in that dialogue, and it's not a good moment to enter in. And she said that Satan spoiled our gaze at God. So when we are in that dialogue with the tempter, we're faced with untruth. And then she went on to speak about distrust, saying that, how broken our Lord is in his own heart when he said to St. Faustina, quoting Jesus, that distrust in the power of my love is tearing at my insides. Even my own death is not enough for them. What further proof do you need of my love? Our Lord said to St. Faustina. Distrust in the power of my love tearing at my insides. 
So sister was giving us a type of equation. Untruth, lies, distrust. What does it lead to? Well, at least mediocrity. Fear, isolation, loneliness. Remember, distrust towards God is always deadly. And sister said that the first fruit of sin is fear. We see that in Adam and Eve in the garden. She said it's like a leash by which Satan holds on to us. I begin that way to tie us together, but also to take up that challenge, fear. What does fear do? It prevents you from acting. It prevents you from being. It prevents you from becoming the man, the woman God made you to be. It prevents you from fulfilling the hopes that God has for you. Remember, every one of us, how unique in the creation of every living being, only one of us. And when God makes us in his likeness and image, each one of us, has God has a hope for our lives. And that fear, isolation, loneliness, that's a fruit of the lies of the dialogue with Satan, a fruit of the lies of the distrust of God leads us to that isolation, to that loneliness. There's a certain resistance in our lives. You know, the last time, I think, Sister and I were together in Poland, we were at the Mercy Center with Pope Francis, and at the end of his talk, he said that there are two conditions to the young people gathered there, two conditions to meet at the next World Youth Day in Panama. One, he said, do not be afraid. And the second, remember where you came from. Remember who you are. Know who God made you to be. I'm going to tell you a story about a young woman I know I was her chaplain once upon a time. Her name is Abby D'Agostino. And she was the most decorated Ivy League track and field athlete in history. You might remember hearing about her last summer during the Olympic Games. You see, Abby, for all that she accomplished, finally was accepted onto the United States team, and she was running in one of the trials. And tragically, she collided with Nikki Hamblin of New Zealand, and both Abby and Nikki went down in the heat, fell down. And what you see on TV, Abby turns around, and she goes backward to help up Nikki Hamlin, her competitor from New Zealand, And she said, get up, get up, we have to finish this. You know, and she was running in a a very quick race. And so, you know, for sure at that moment that they fell, they were immediately the last two. Get up, get up, we have to finish this. In an interview later, Abby wrote that that morning, she read a passage from scripture from Ephesians 3.20 and wrote it on her arm. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory. In the interview, of course, you might know the rest of the story, Abby helped up Nikki, and as the two began to run, Abby herself uh, had pulled a, something in her leg and so she literally couldn't run anymore and she could barely limp across uh, the finish line but in an interview later she said now I know why I wrote that passage she said about our Lord you've done it all 
and it has been my absolute joy to thank you. She had to have surgery after that, but she was named uh, the winner of the uh, Olympic, uh, spirit of the Olympics, let's say. Abby D'Agostino, 25, following the Lord. Get up, get up. We have to finish this. What is the resistance in your life? What is those things that you are afraid of? Refuse to settle, compete well. You know, St. John Paul II had uh, an equation. We can say a, a trinomial, three words that he said go together when we think about all that we're talking about, especially trust. And he said that we see it in every dimension of our lives, our social, political, economic, cultural, family, and marriage. And it's based on a fundamental dimension of who we are and who God made us to be. And in a speech in Wrocław, Poland, 1983, he said, truth plus trust equals community. That's the equation. Truth plus trust equals community or communion. He said we often see it in the negative way that we talked about earlier. That uh, lies plus distrust lead to that sense of isolation, of fear, of loneliness, of mediocrity, of not being able to break out, of not becoming who God made us to be. We can think, of course, in terms of trust, but another example that occurred in another garden. Of course, our Lord, who was in perfect communion with his heavenly Father, we know that the liar, the enemy, the devil still tempted him. We have the temptations, of course, that we read at the beginning of Lent. This is from Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus, led by the Spirit out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He was very hungry. And the tempter, the liar, came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to turn into loaves. Jesus replied, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil then took him up the holy city and made him stand on the parapet of the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For scripture says he will put you in the angel's charge and they will support you on their hands in case you hurt your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, you must not put the Lord your God to the test. And taking him to a very high mountain, the devil, the liar, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. I will give you all these, the liar said, if you fall at my feet and worship me. Then Jesus replied, be off Satan. For scripture says, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Then the devil left him, and angels appeared and looked after him. In the other scriptures, it says he went only to return at another time. We know, of course, what that other time was. It was a night like tonight. It was during his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. And those three temptations that our Lord in his human nature faced, I think can be broken down into three questions. Who is God? Who are you? Who are they? The mission in front of you. Who is God? No doubt that was a question 
Jesus who had to answer, who is the Father? Jesus is the one who loves the Father, who knows the Father. The liar trying to tempt him, trying to get him to think, well, you know, if you take up this cross, will the Father raise you from the dead? Does, is he really your Father? Who is God? Who are you? Throw yourself down. See if the angels catch you. Who are you? Take up your cross. If you die, will you be raised? Are you really the Son of God? Who are you? Who are they? Why should you go through all this suffering? Just bow down before the liar, and he'll give you everything, all power, all authority, all people, and then you could bring him to your Father. Who is God? Who are you? Who are they? I think fundamentally in our own lives, those become the questions that you and I also have to face, especially in the face of fear, in the face of those things that come from outside of us, in the face of our own resistance to doing things, in the face of our own mediocrity, in the ways that sometimes we feel we can't really compete or compete well, or we're limping, or we've fallen. Remember, who is God? God is the one who made you. God is the one who allows this cross in your life, gives you that cross as your way to salvation. Who are you? You're a son. You're a daughter of God. You're one already redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. You're one that by his passion and death and suffering and wounds, he has saved. And that task in front of you, what is it that's so difficult, so hard, that maybe makes us settle for not doing that, anything but that? What is it worth? The Lord who made you can help you to accomplish and carry that cross for that task in front of you. You know, in 1987, John Paul II visited communist Poland. And it was the same exact day that uh, President Reagan in Berlin gave a famous speech, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. And God's designs that same day, St. John Paul II gave, I would say, an even more powerful speech. Visiting uh, the site of Vesterplot. Vesterplot is where World War II began. It's a little outpost in the north of Poland on the sea near Gdańsk. And the Polish troops had built a little fortress there. There were 200 of them. And there was a, a German Nazi warship about 200 yards away, supposedly on a peace mission. And at 5 a.m. on September 1st, this uh, ship began shelling this outpost of 200 Polish men. And then the uh, Nazi Kriegsmarine stormed uh, that area as well. The Polish men were outnumbered uh, two, uh, 10 to 1 at least. And they just knew that their orders were, hold on for 12 hours. And in 12 hours time, they anticipated that they would get relief in some way or other. After six days, the garrison finally surrendered, having inflicted many hundreds of other casualties. And it was at that spot to the communist uh, young adults who were gathered there under communism, Poland, John Paul II said this, even if others do not demand much from you, you must demand of yourselves. Each one of you will find in your life your own vesterplot, a task you must assume and complete, some just cause 
in which it is impossible not to fight, some duty, some obligation from which you cannot escape and from which, which it is impossible to desert. A certain order of truths and values you are obliged to maintain and defend. In such a moment, and there are many of them, for they are not something exceptional, remember, Christ is passing by you and saying, follow me. Do not abandon him. Do not run away. Hear that call. Each one of you will have your own Vesterplatt something you cannot escape from. Christ at that moment is passing by you and saying, follow me. Do not abandon him. Do not run away. Hear that call. Compete well. Refuse to live mediocrity. It seems to me that the only way to do this is with the trust, the trust that God, who is our Father, is God, the trust that you and I are sons and daughters redeemed by our Heavenly Father with a certain task that he has made us for, and it's just that task that you are called to do. Do not run away. Do not abandon Jesus. Follow him. Hear that call. We return to that equation, the trinomial of St. John Paul II. To live in the truth plus trust equals community. Notice that it doesn't say to live in unanimity or a type of, you know, everything is, is, is fine. Because we know oftentimes when we just paper over things like that, right? Maybe we're not really sharing something true. And in fact, this uh, applies to married life, to your spouse, to your boyfriend, to your girlfriend. It also applies with God. If there's certain truths that you don't speak, that you don't say, that you don't admit to, and you just paper over, ultimately you will have a moment of distrust. But if you live in the truth and even share hard truths and disagreements, you could then begin to move beyond those disagreements and move to a place where you can even trust that person who you disagree with. And then you can at least begin to have a type of communion or community. Truth plus trust equals community. Tonight, I invite you to think of those areas of your life where you need to overcome that fear, that woundedness, that sense of fear that maybe paralyzes you, or just leaves you feeling blah. Maybe there's a truth that you haven't admitted to yourself or to God. Maybe there's some truth that you need to bring to confession to seek his reconciliation and his mercy. You know, we, we cannot trust someone we don't know. Part of truth is knowledge, knowledge too of who the Lord is, of who God is. Steep yourself in the scriptures, the Psalms, in your own prayer, wafting over your heart. In that way, knowing who God is, allowing him to speak heart to heart to you, you'll move deeper into the truth of who God is, and then that second level of who you are, of who he made you to be. And then, no matter how difficult, including being surrounded 10 to 1 odds against you, 
whatever your task is, you'll then begin and be able to go forward. You'll begin and be able to trust that this is what God has made you for. This is what he calls you to. Living in the truth, having then that trust that comes from living in the truth, you will finally be at that spot of communion, of community, of delighting, even in the difficult and the hard and even in the sad tasks that might come your way. You'll delight to know that you're doing the will of God, that this is what he made you for, that these are the hopes that he had for you from the very beginning that you and you alone can accomplish this. Get up, get up. We have to finish this, Abby D'Agostino said. Compete well. Remember, Christ is passing you by, saying, follow me. Do not abandon him. Do not run away. Hear his call.